Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading to you from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 9 That Matherson's words were only a threat, and that he would never really carry them out, was what Pansy told herself. It's, it's just to frighten me, and I won't be frightened. She made up her mind resolutely, but something in her heart seemed to deny her conviction. She would die before she allowed Buster to be sent to boarding school, and yet how could she prevent it? Basil was Buster's father, and he had equal rights over him. More, as he had once told her, seeing that he paid the piper. Where would either of you be without my money? He had been very angry indeed when he said that, and, although Pansy had answered spiritedly that she could work, she knew in her heart he was right. She would hate to go back to poverty and monotony after, she, after the luxury to which her marriage had accustomed her. She would hate to see Buster cheaply dressed and know that she must dispense with Joyce. And if she quarreled finally with Basil, she knew he was quite capable of treating her in the worst possible way. And, although until lately they had never had any serious trouble, she knew exactly how far he would go. He was not a hasty man who would flare out one moment and forget it. He was not a hasty man who would flare out one minute and forget it quickly. He tore at a subject until it was in tatters. He never forgot a small grievance. It was with fear that she recalled his threat that if he quarreled with Lynn, it would mean ruination to them all. Pansy did not believe that. She knew nothing of business or financial matters. She knew that her husband's income had been left to him by his father, and she therefore supposed that nothing could remove or lessen it. No, Basil had merely wished to frighten her. She argued herself into, she argued herself into fresh courage, which vanished when she lay awake at night, unable to sleep. She tried to picture Buster, with his hair cropped, sleeping in a dormitory with other boys, who had frightened the life out of him. She could imagine his terror, his longing for her, and she felt that if such a thing happened, she would die of grief. It had almost broke her heart today to see the wheel to see the wheels across his little hands where Basil had gained him, and she had been there then to kiss him to kiss in comfort. She would not be at school with him. She got up and crept into his room. She sat down beside him, one tiny hand in hers as he slept. I'll die before he shall go, she told herself passionately. In the morning, she spoke of her fear to Joyce. Basil threatens to send Buster to boarding school. Joyce looked incredulous. Not seriously. That's only to frighten you. I shouldn't take any notice. Then he'll forget it, she advised. But the following evening, Basil broached the subject again. Have you written to Ramsden? He asked. The treacherous color flew to Pansy's cheeks. Of course not. Why should I? You said he was away. You're splitting straws, he told her curtly. Any letter sent to Chiswells would be forwarded, of course. Pansy's pretty face grew obstinate, and a fighting expression crept into her eyes. I've nothing to write to Mr. Ramsden about anyway. Basil rose to his feet. You mean, refuse to carry out my wishes? Yes, if that is what they are. Very well, his voice was sudden, suddenly quiet. Then you can get Buster ready to leave home next week. I found a good school where he will be treated. I found a good school where he will be well treated and taught obedience. Pansy gave a stifled cry. I will die before he shall go. Matherson shrugged his shoulders. That is your own lookout, he answered. But if, as you so dramatically put it, you mean to die, you can rest assured that he will go the very minute you are out of the way. Her eyes blazed as she looked at him, but some instinct seemed to tell her that he was in deadly earnest, and she controlled herself with a great effort. There's something behind all of this, of course, she said at last. Matherson frowned. I've already told you what there is. You're a foolish woman. It's only a small thing I ask you to do. Write a nice little letter that will put things right with Ramsden, and I'll say no more about sending Buster away. She sat silent for some minutes, her eyes downcast, a great battle going on in her heart. She hated giving way to him, and yet something warned her that she would have to. Very well, she said heavily at last. Matherson's face changed. That's right! 
right. I thought you'd be sensible. He came across the room and laid his hand on her arm. You'll never be sorry for putting your pride in your pocket this once. My pride? Isn't it yours as well? Pansy asked coldly. We don't want another argument, he answered. You say, you say you'll do as I wish, and that's all that matters. Right now, and I'll post the letter tonight. No. Oh. He moved back a step. I say you will write the letter now, he repeated angrily. She looked up at him. She felt utterly cowed and beaten. Very well. Matherson smiled again. There's a good girl. He put his hand beneath her chin, bent and kissed her lips. They felt like ice. Pansy went over to a writing table. What shall I say? He waved a magnanimous hand. Oh, say what you like. You know the kind of thing. He paced up and down the room, whistling softly, while she penned a few lines with stiff fingers. Presently, she pushed it across the desk to him. Will that do? Matherson took, up, took the paper up. Dear Mr. Remsden, what has happened to you that ha what has happened to you that you have not been to see us lately? I'm afraid it must be my fault for being so silly that day at lunch. I must apologize and hope you will not think of it again. Will you come to dinner with us on Saturday if you're back at Giswell's? Kind regards. Yours very sincerely, Pansy Matherson. Very tactful, quite charming, Matherson said. Address an envelope and I'll post it now. Pansy obeyed. She felt cold and her head ached unbearably. What would Lynn think? She wondered. What would he think? Matherson kissed her again and she gave him the sealed envelope. That's a good girl, he said. We're friends again now. Eh? She laughed. <laughs> oh, yes, if, 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 if you like. But in her heart, she hated him, and the knowledge terrified her. Where would they end if things went on like this? When he had gone, she sat. When they had gone, she sat staring at the blotting paper that still shone. That still showed the beginning words of her letter. Dear Mr. Ramsden, what would he think? What would he think? A sudden thought came to her. She took a fresh sheet of paper and began to write feverishly. Feverishly, Nerlin. I want to see you. I want to tell you something. I can't explain, but for the sake of old, but for the sake of the old days, if you'll just see me for a few minutes, I shall be eternally grateful. Pansy. She slipped out of the house and posted it herself. Then she ran back to the house, breathing fast. He didn't come if he despises me too much, she thought, and if he doesn't come or answer, that will be the end of everything anyway. Have you heard from Ramsden? Matherson asked the following day. Pansy raised her gray eyes. How can I have heard? You said he went away. You said that my letter would have to be sent on. I know, but I believe he is home. Kate says he heard in the village this morning that he is home. Pansy turned away. Why don't you go and see then? She asked. He looked annoyed. I'm not going to run after the fellow. I don't want him to think I'm anxious for his company. He'll answer your letter if he's got any decency. And that same evening, a letter was brought from Chris. And that same evening, a letter was brought from Chiswell's. The man is waiting for a reply, the maid told Pansy as she gave it to her. Pansy opened the envelope with nervous fingers. It was years since she had had a letter from Lynn, and there had been so many in the past. She remembered that she had made a little bonfire of them all the night before her wedding. There were two now in the envelope. Dear Mrs. Matherson, thank you for your note. I have been away, or should certainly have been over to see you before this. I shall be delighted to dine on Saturday. Kindest regards. Sincerely, Lynn Ramston. The second was folded into a little three-cornered note, and for a moment Pansy felt as if she was back in the past, in the days when Lynn had adored her. He had always folded his notes into a little three-cornered hat. He had thrown them up to her bedroom window many times, when she had been especially unkind to him. Her lips trembled as she unfolded it. Dear Pansy, I don't know if you want me to come to the house, or if you would rather I did not. Please send a reply by the messenger, and I will keep any appointment you make. Lynn. Pansy scribbled a hurried line. No, don't come to the house. I will be at the gate leading to Hazel Lane tonight at half past nine. I won't keep you long. Pansy. She waited till the messenger had had time to leave. Then she took the first note to her husband. You see, she said, I need it. I need not have humiliated myself after all. Matherson read the note and screwed it up in his hand. I know better, he insisted. Ramsden would never have come here again if you hadn't written. However, all's well that ends well. He called to her when she turned to go. I've got your brooch, Pansy. We found it caught in some rushes. I should have given it to you before, only I thought I would wait and see how you meant to behave to me. He held out his little case. He held out the little case. 
Pansy looked at it and shivered. I don't want it. Thank you. I never want to see it again, she said and walked out of the room. She was filled with nervous excitement at the thought of seeing Lynn. A dozen times she regretted the impulse that had made her write the second note to him, and yet how could she let the whole matter pass without some attempt to justify herself? She almost wished that something would happen to prevent her from keeping the appointment, and yet she was conscious of an aching joy when Matherson announced that he had got a man coming to see him on business after dinner, and that he did not wish to be disturbed. Pansy lowered her eyes to hide their relief. Not Mr. Ramston, I suppose, she asked breathlessly. Nobody you know at all, Matherson said. He had been quite agreeable since he had read Lynn's note, and for the first time he seemed to notice the strained weariness in his wife's face, for he added more kindly. You look tired. I should go to bed early. I probably shall. She shrank a little when he put an arm round her. You've helped me out of you've helped me out of a most infernal hole, he said frankly. I'm much obliged to you, Pansy. When all this business is settled satisfactorily, I'll take you abroad somewhere, shall I? You'll like that. Thank you. Yes, that will be nice, she said. His arm fell from her waist. You don't sound very enthusiastic, he complained. But the man, whoever he was, was late arriving, and it was after and it was after half past nine when Smales came to announce A gentleman in the library to see you, sir. Matherson rose. I'll come immediately. He seemed very eager. He left the room without another word to Pansy, and as soon as she heard the library door close, she flew upstairs. She put a woolly coat over her light frock and stole down into the garden. The moon was shining fitfully. Now and then banks of billowy clouds scud scudded up and hid it completely. Pansy felt thankful that it was not very light, and she ran across the lawn and along the shrubbery path that led to the hazel lane gate. And he waited. She must be very late, and for the first time in her life she felt afraid of the silent country all around her. What could she say to him? How could she begin? She wished she had not come, and then, as she was hesitating as to whether she would return or not, the moon sailed out from behind the clouds, and she saw Lynn Ramston at the gate. He came forward quickly. He was breathing fast as if he had been hurrying. Pansy spoke breathlessly. I'm sorry to be late. I couldn't help it. It was kind of you to wait so long. Ramston opened the gate for her to pass out. If you had not come by ten o'clock, I should have gone up to the house, he said. After your note, I meant to see you tonight, whatever happened. But now she was with him again. The need for the meeting seemed to have vanished, and she was at a loss to explain herself. The night was so peaceful, with the scent of a newly mown of newly mown hay and the pale moonlight overhead, that she was conscious only of infinite content of infinite content as she walked down the narrow little lane by his side. The troubles and hundred and one little annoyances of the day were forgotten for the moment. She was glad to be quiet, and and with someone whom she instinctively felt would not misunderstand her. It was only when presently she looked up at him and felt his eyes upon her that she woke with a little start. You are wondering why I wrote to you, why I am here. She began, she began confusedly, and now I am with you. It all seems so trivial and unnecessary, but I didn't want you. I mean, I couldn't bear you to think that it was I who really wanted you to come to the house. I shouldn't have written that letter at all, only she broke off. Matherson made you, Ramsden said. Yes, he was very angry with me. He said he would never come to see us again, and that it was my fault, and I couldn't, I wanted, oh, do you think it's very horrible of me to say that, to say these things about Basil? I wouldn't, to anyone else, only I've known you so long. You can say anything you like to me. I shall understand. She caught her breath. I know, and that's why, if I seem too nice to you, if I keep asking you to come see us, you won't think it's because I, I really want you by myself, will you, Lynn? It's only that... She broke off, struck by the expression of his face in the moonlight. Oh, have I said anything to hurt you? She faltered. Ramston shook his head. No, it only struck me as being rather funny that you should be afraid I might think you wanted me. I've never been such an optimist as that, Pansy. There was a painful silence. Pansy drew the woolly coat cl more closely around her. She felt suddenly cold, as if a breath of memory had swept over her heart reminding her how utterly she was shut out from this man's life. Had warned him. The words cut her to the soul. She knew that he had not really understood her stumbling explanation, that he must be thinking her merely selfish or foolish or perhaps just afraid. And in sudden desperation, she made up her mind to tell him the truth. She began to speak again, tremblingly. I don't know what you'll think of me. 
but I shall have to tell you everything after all. I didn't mean to, but I can't bear you to think any worse of me than you do already. Lynn, it isn't all my fault that Basil and I, and I don't get on better together. I have tried my best. I do still, but it seems no good. He almost drives me mad. And then, after that last day, the last day you came, when he threatened to take Buster away from me, her voice broke. Take Buster away. Yes, to send him to boarding school. And he's only a baby still, isn't he? He's never been away from me. It would have killed me to lose him. And so, uh, and so that's why I wrote to you. He said you were disgusted with me, Lynn, and that we should never see, see you again unless I wrote and apologized for the scene I made. And he said she could say no more. The shame of it seemed to scorch her. Ramsden had been walking rather quickly. His hands rammed into his coat pockets, but now he stopped, though he did not though he did not look at her as he asked. You mean, Matherson wishes me to continue coming to, to your house? Yes, he said he had some important business with you. I see. There was a moment's silence. Then he asked again, and he thinks you were able to influence me to come again. Yes, at least, I, I suppose so. She was on the verge of tears. The knowledge of her love for this man added to her distress a hundredfold. If she had not cared for him, it would have been comparatively easy to appeal to his generosity, to understand and help her. She went on, struggling hard for composure. I don't know why he thinks so. Oh, you don't think it's because of anything I've said to him, do you, Lynn? Anything you've said to him? About me, you mean? About what happened, years ago, that you used to, used to like me? No. The monosyllable was curt and, and unsympathetic. And suddenly Pansy felt the tears running down her cheeks. She put up a shaking hand and brushed them away. But they came again and again, and when at last she went on speaking, her voice was all broken up with little pitiful sobs. I hate having to ask you if you don't like coming to the house. I know, I know it must be horrible for you, but it's worse for me. And if you'd just come for a little while, perhaps later on, Basil wouldn't mind so much. And I'll do everything I can to make it all right. There shan't be any more scenes. I promise you faithfully, but I must keep Buster. I'll do anything in the world to keep him. If he goes away, I shall die. Pansy. For God's sake, don't cry so. Ramston broke out hoarsely. It's all right. I'll do anything you want me to. Anything. Anything. She fought hard for composure. They had reached a wider part of the lane, where a five-barred gate on the left led to some woods, and Pansy turned to it and leaned her arms on the top bar, pressing her hands fiercely over her eyes to stop the tears. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to make a scene, she whispered presently. I'll be all right directly. Ramston stood beside her silently, his back to the gate, his face very grim in the moonlight, and for some moments neither of them spoke. Then Pansy laughed, a choked, unhappy little laugh. <laughs> I suppose it serves me right, all this, she said hoarsely. I'd been selfish, all my life. I needn't have married Basil if I hadn't wished. It's not his fault. I'm really the one to blame, because it was his money I wanted. I thought I could be happy. She looked up at Lynn. I've often remembered what you said to me. She went on brokenly, that I should be sorry someday for my heartlessness. You are right, Lynn. I am sorry. If it wasn't for Buster. She could not go on. She hid her face once more, and the bitter sobbing began again. Ramston stood like a man of stone, and it was only when she sobbed out in broken anguish. Oh. Go away, please, please go away, that he moved. He turned deliberately and, not in the least as if impulse drove him, he took her into his arms. He held her to his breast as if she had been a child in trouble, not speaking a word, just silently comforting her with the clasp of his arms. And at last, when her, sob when her sobbing had, quiet had quietened and she moved to look up at him with shamed eyes, he said, in the quiet, steady voice of a man who knows his own heart and who speaks the truth from his very soul. I've never ceased to love you. I've always been this. It's always been the same with me. All the years I never saw you made no difference. I'd give everything I've got in the world to make you happy. Pansy did not move. She stood there, her head resting against his arm, looking up at him. But he read in her eyes the avowal for which he had waited so many years. He caught his breath with a harsh sound, and for a moment the moonlight seemed blotted out. 
He was not a vain man, and it had never occurred to him that Pansy might have grown to care for him. He had told her of his own faithful love, with the hope and longing that it might comfort her to know that there was someone who would never fail her. But now in a flash everything had changed, and he saw the pitfall which she had opened at her feet. She loved him. The knowledge struck fear to his heart, even while it turned him with almost fa almost faint with rapture. In his fear for her, he would have given ten... In his fear for her, he would have given ten years of his life to have undone the past few moments, even while his love exulted in passionate triumph. His clasp tightened about her, as if to shield her against the future and this new shadow that menaced them both, and Pansy lifted her arms and clasped them round his neck, drawing him down to her. I love you too, Lynn. I love you. For a moment he resisted, then, with a little smothered cry, he bent and kissed her. Everything was forgotten in that first delirious happiness. Passionate kisses and whispered words spanned the bridges of years and wiped out all that had divided them. I love you. I've never ceased to love you. It seemed as if he could not say it often enough. Presently he raised her, and with a hand on either of her shoulders, looked into her face with adoring eyes. Pansy, when was it you cared? Not till after that first day, was it? Her eyes fell. I, I think it was directly I saw you again. Her voice was only a whisper. Lynn, I went away because I was afraid. Afraid? Then that was it. The, the, the look in your eyes, I couldn't understand. I thought of everything that might explain it, but never that you loved me. She hid her face against his coat. I was so, so, so afraid you would guess. That was why I, why I came tonight. I was afraid you might guess and think that was why I, I wanted you to come to the house. I thought you had forgotten all about me. Never for a day, never for a moment. He bent and kissed her again, passionately. Then they stood for a moment looking at each other, the same thought in both their hearts. And now, what will become of us now? It was Lynn who spoke first. He took her hands in a warm, firm clasp and held them against his heart. Everything shall be as you wish, Pansy. Whatever you wish will be right for me. She, she shook her head, her lips quivering. I can't. I mean... It wouldn't be right, Lynn. I need not have married him. I did it to please myself. He did not answer, but she saw the spasm of pain that crossed his face, and she turned her eyes away. There's Buster, she whispered, and at the mention of the and at the mention of that little name their hands fell apart. There was a tragic silence, broken by the slow chime of the church clock. Pansy drew her coat closer to, closer around her. It's late. I must go home. She looked up and tried to smile. Lynn Don't look so sad, she appealed. He caught her hand again. It drives me mad to know you're going back. To him, he said hoarsely. Pansy, he doesn't. He's never struck you, has he? No, no, she cried out quickly, afraid of the look in his eyes. Sometimes he's kind, quite kind. It's only lately since you came. It's all seemed so much harder to bear. He looked away from her down the narrow lane, which the moonlight threw the troops. He looked away from her down the narrow lane, which the moonlight through the trees overhead had patterned with a shadow tracery, and it was some moments before he could trust himself to speak. Then he said quietly, I'll take you home now. They went back to the garden gate, hand in hand, and there Pansy stopped. You mustn't come any further, please. Very well. He took her in his arms. Say just once, I love you, Lynn. I love you. She tried to obey, but broke down. What shall we do? What shall we do? She whispered in anguish. He forced himself to composure. He soothed her with gentle words. You're not to blame. Everything's been my fault. You're not to worry. I shall see you tomorrow. Promise me you won't worry. I'll try not to, but tomorrow won't be the same as tonight, Lynn, if I can't bear it. He set his teeth. There must be a way out. There must be a way out for us, Pansy. There must. Then he tried to smile. It will be all right, my darling. You can trust me. You know that. I'll die before I let you suffer through me. It's Buster, she said again pitifully. I love him. 
I love him too because he's yours, he answered. He bent and kissed her hair. You're not to lie awake and worry. You're to go to sleep. Promise me. <laughs> yes, if, if I can. And I shall see you tomorrow. She nodded, with tears in her eyes, smiling tremulously. <laughs> yes, I, I forgot. I asked you to dinner, didn't I? I'm coming before that. I shall drive over soon after breakfast. It's only good night then. Good night, my sweet. He did not kiss her again. He just held her hands hard for a moment, then turned away, and Pansy fled back to the house through the silent garden. The front door stood wide open, the yellow light from the hall streaming out into the darkness, and as she went up the, ste up the steps, Matherson came from the library. He looked relieved when he saw her. Oh, there you are. We've searched everywhere for you. She drew back with a quick, frightened breath. For me, she faltered. Yes. He took her hand. His eyes were kinder than she could remember having seen them. I'm, I'm sorry, dear. There's, there's bad news. A call came through on the phone just now from Lidstow, your father. Ted? Pansy asked in anguish. Not, not Ted. But she knew that he was. And that is the end of chapter nine of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope that you return soon for the next one. Have a great day!